Through these cold and rugged mountains marched the adventure of a millennium. They showed us what our future would be. But the bitter roots of Idaho almost ended the expedition of Lewis and Clark. It was really the scariest moment for the Lewis and Clark expedition, where the whole thing, the whole expedition was on the verge of, of, of perishing. Today on Exploring Idaho, what you never learned in school about the journey of the core of discovery. Even if you know what you're doing, it's hard work. How a native people held history in their hands and chose to help. It's my favorite story of something that never happened. And how Lewis and Clark left behind a legacy on the expedition in Idaho. It was an odyssey that changed the future of the continent, and it cut right through the heart of Idaho. Today, we follow in the footsteps of the Lewis and Clark expedition. High in the Bitterroot Mountains of Idaho lives a story of danger, perseverance, and near peril. And if you're sensitive when you're hiking through these mountains, you can't help but feel a sense of awe and wonder at the first white explorers to step foot in the West. Hello, I'm Dee Sarton, and this is Exploring Idaho. It's been almost 200 years since the historic journey of Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark and their crew of more than 30 explorers. The Corps of Discovery, as they called themselves, began their trip in 1803 in St. Louis, Missouri. They pushed, paddled, and pulled their way up the Missouri River through raging rapids, foreign Indian nations, and what is now Nebraska, the Dakotas, and Montana. It took two years and untold dedication to reach the headwaters of the Missouri River in Montana. Their mission was to find an all-water route that would connect the eastern United States with the Pacific Ocean. But what they found instead was an end to the Missouri River and the beginning of a near deadly ordeal right here in the Bitterroot Mountains. Lewis and Clark's first steps into what is now Idaho were almost their last. The Bitterroot Mountains reach above 10,000 feet with peaks perennially capped in snow. The range contributes to the Great Continental Divide which splits the rivers of the eastern United States from the rivers of the west. Captains Lewis and Clark were Easterners. The only mountains they knew were the rolling Appalachians. Natives on the plains told them of the treacherous western mountains. Some tribes even warned the mountains were impassable. But Lewis and Clark did not fathom the reality of the warning until they reached Idaho and became the first Americans to lay eyes on the Bitterroot Range. We proceeded onto the top of the dividing ridge from which I discovered immense ranges of high mountains still to the west of us, with their tops partially covered with snow. Captain Meriwether Lewis. The jagged, snow-topped peaks were a sobering discovery. But with horses they bought from the Shoshones near present Salmon, Idaho, and a native guide to lead the way, the expedition moved into the mountains on a crisp September morning in 1805. They were now almost two years into this expedition, and this was the place above all others in which they came the closest to having to turn back or dying. Mm -hmm. And actually, they would have died before they would have turned back. Author Stephen Ambrose has retraced the steps of Lewis and Clark. His historical account of the expedition is spelled out with riveting detail in his book, Undaunted Courage. Ambrose says when the Lewis and Clark expedition pushed ahead on this narrow Nez Perce hunting trail, history almost took a terrible turn. So this was the most dangerous, life-threatening, exhausting part of the trip for them. And they were starving. They were starving, and of course, there was no game in the mountains. People don't think of this, but elk are not a mountain animal. They're an animal of the plains who have been driven into the mountains. Grizzly bears are not a mountain animal. They've been driven. So for them, there was no game. I mean, they relied on their rifles for their commissary. That's what fed them. The rifles didn't do them any good up here. 
Hungry and tired, the men hiked through an absolute maze of deadwood. Their pack horses often stumbled and fell without food and famished from exertion. At one point, the men resorted to eating their young colt just to survive. But the expedition carried a large quantity of vital supplies, and to carry those supplies, they needed their horses. So something had to be done, and quickly, to prevent total starvation. Six days into the journey, and only halfway through the mountains, the expedition was at the breaking point. September 16th. 13 miles over the mountain passing. Immense, difficult knobs, stony, much falling timber, and immensely steep. With great difficulty, we proceeded on. I have been wet and as cold in every part as I ever was in my life. Captain William Clark. Extreme fatigue and hunger were tearing the expedition apart. The situation was critical. September 17, 1805 crossed several creeks or spring runs in the course of the day, came many miles this day, and camped at a small branch on the mountain near a round, deep sinkhole full of water. Private Joseph Whitehouse. That became known as the sinkhole camp, and this marker is literally just steps from it. It was at that site on the evening of September 17, 1805, that Lewis and Clark made a drastic decision one they hoped would get their men out of the mountains alive. And so they, they, they took a very desperate step. They split up, and Clark, with a small party, went ahead to get down out of these mountains and find some Indians who could help. Mm -hmm. And they did, the Nez Perce. And they sent back fish and roots to the main party, which was coming on behind them. And they just did make it, mm -hmm. just barely. Lewis caught up with Clark 12 days after the expedition first set foot in the mountains. Together, they camped and ate with the Nez Perce on the Weite Prairie. Finally, the bitter roots were behind them, but their ordeal was far from over. As we'll find out later, the Nez Perce tribe played an integral part in the expedition's safe journey through Idaho. Lewis and Clark might be dismayed to know that the same pass that nearly defeated them back in 1805 today takes only a few hours by car. Highway 12 winds through the Bitterroot Mountains parallel to the actual Lewis and Clark Trail. Also known as the Clearwater Canyon Scenic Byway, Highway 12 ducks through fragrant cedar and pine forests alongside the Clearwater and Locksaw Rivers. The drive is one of the hidden gems of Idaho. We think it is one of the most beautiful highways and areas in the United States. We've had beautiful weather, the water's wonderful, the people and the campers are nice, people from all over. Campsites line the highway and attract travelers from faraway places. But what may be most rewarding about driving Highway 12 is the history that follows you every mile of the way. If you think back and take 200 years of our advancement, uh, what we have changed in 200 years, yet this is still just a beautiful country to come through and see, and we can still see it. We're very fortunate to have it. For the more adventurous, hiking is open on the actual Lewis and Clark Trail. It's called the Lolo Trail, and it runs about 10 miles north of Highway 12, right through the mountains. The Lolo Trail remains much as it was when the expedition passed this way. Many of the original campsites are marked with information on Lewis and Clark. Altogether, about 100 miles of the Lolo Trail wind through the Bitterroot Mountains. The trail is open to hikers and campers, but when you're up here, land or rough it, there are no established campgrounds. And here's another option. A full-size four-wheel drive can make it through some portions of the trail that have been widened to a dirt road. No matter how you get here, the scenery is stunning and the sense of history inspiring. Recently, Exploring Idaho producer Jennifer Eisenhardt had the rare opportunity to interview well-known historian Dayton Duncan on the Lolo Trail. For Lewis and Clark, the Bitterroots was an ordeal. You know, they, it was a lot longer getting through than they'd expected. They ran out of food. It mm -hmm. snowed on them. They were cold. They didn't know where they were or how much farther the mountains were going to extend. Well, they got lost at least once. Yeah, they got lost, and it was a terrible thing for them. They, they wrote about a lot of places and how beautiful they were. They didn't say one good word about <laughs> the Bitterroots, but uh, almost 200 years later, it's one of the most scenic, 
unspoiled parts of the whole Lewis and Clark Trail. So the very thing that made it an ordeal for them, it's isolation and, and the cold, if you're here in the wrong season, is the thing that in effect helped protect it and preserve it to make it one of the nicest places on the Lewis and Clark Trail today. A token of peace from Lewis and Clark to the Nez Perce tribe. This metal peace medallion is one of only two still in existence. It was given to the Nez Perce when Lewis and Clark first came out of the Bitterroot Mountains, weak and hungry. The friendship formed with the Nez Perce became a fortunate turn of luck for Lewis and Clark, who could have easily died of starvation in their weakened state. But instead of taking advantage of the sickly men, the Nez Perce chose to help. They shared food and valuable information to get the expedition back on track. Here at the Nez Perce Historical Museum in Spalding, visitors can learn more about the Nez Perce and about the vital role they played in the Lewis and Clark expedition. In display after display, the Spalding Museum showcases Nez Perce history. Everything from ceremonial garb to ordinary tools offers visitors a glimpse at traditional tribal life. The work seems to be a very fine quality. I mean, imagine surviving all these years and then the kind of harsh conditions they lived in, too. All the displays are surprisingly well-preserved. And if you look to a small glass case in the back of the building, you'll discover a rare treat, actual artifacts from the Lewis and Clark expedition. There's a couple of items here that are, that are very rare and very unusual, uh, particularly the, the peace metal of uh, it was found up on the Palouse. It actually belongs to the Nespers tribe. It's been on exhibit here since we opened in 1981. It's uh, an excellent example of, of the friendship that was really the mainstay of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Other gifts given in friendship, this silk ribbon, valuable trade beads, and metal tools. But there were a lot of things that worked for the Lewis and Clark expedition. I think that they didn't approach people from a, a warlike stance. They had a, a woman with them, which was very important. Uh, the Kagawea was, uh, showed that that was not a war party, and that was a very important part of the way that they traveled. Another important part of Lewis and Clark history is the major role the Nez Perce played in saving the expedition. They treated them well, they fed them, they, they even uh, provided guides for them to continue their journey to the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. So they became great friends with the explorers. And uh, I think the Nespers tribe in itself, you know, had great pride in helping uh, the explorers by, by, you might say, saving them from starvation because they were very weak and coming over the Bitterroot Mountains. And while it is hard to imagine exactly what life was like for the Nez Perce and their famous explorer guests, the Historical Museum in Spalding offers, at least, a window into that world. One of the things that people can see are things that were actually from that time period. I think that's real important. A lot of times you see things on TV and other places that, that may not be as real as to actually look at something that you know that that was on the expedition, that was with the people that were there and both with the Nez Perce, with the ribbon, and with the metal. So I think both those things are very important. And there are places in Idaho where you can learn about the real thing. The Nez Perce also helped Lewis and Clark on the return trip. In the spring of 1806, the expedition camped and lived with the Nez Perce for an entire month while they waited for the snow to melt in the bitter roots. They went hunting, played games, and traded with the tribesmen. And then they crossed the difficult Lolo Pass again, but this time with the help of Nez Perce guides, and this time with little incident. I set out early with the chief and two young men to hunt some trees calculated to build canoes, as we had previously determined to proceed on by water. Captain William Clark. After the expedition met up with the Nez Perce, they laid plans for their long journey onto the Pacific Ocean. 
It was here, along the south shore of the Clearwater River, the men constructed five dugout canoes, much like this one. It was backbreaking work for a crew already exhausted from crossing the mountains. Today, it may be difficult to imagine what was going on in the minds of those men as they prepared for this leg of the epic journey. But not so difficult if you do what a group of Idahoans did recently and place yourself in the moccasins of those young explorers. We've been at this about 17 years, doing reenactments, uh, black powder oh, shooting, and competition, and, and uh, we've always admired the Lewis and Clark expedition. And we just would like to know what it's like to build a dugout and then take it for a ride. It won't take it gives people an opportunity to, to take on something they've never done before, like Billy, really be aggressive and, and, and take a tree and carve it into a dugout. I'm going to do that. And so they get a whole bunch of people together. And I think it brings a lot of community involvement, uh, the challenge to see can we do it, and then do it with friends. To build a dugout, first of all, you have to understand what it takes to do it. It is not a quick thing. you got to be prepared to, to have the blisters, do the sweat, have the right tools that are sharp. A dull tool will kill you. Because this is kind of a project where you keep chomping on and never know when to quit. You take it to the river, if it floats and you all get in it and it stays upright, you're done. I'm interested in history and I've been interested in Lewis and Clark. And so far I have gained nothing but respect for the old timers that did this. It's one thing to sit in a history class like when you're in high school and the intrepid explorers headed west and discovered America. And, you know, that's rather drab. But if you can go out there and say, well, yeah, they built a canoe and they floated down the Clearwater River. Okay, what does that mean? So you come out here and you grab a log and you grab one of these tools and you start sweating. And about 300 hours later, you build one. And then when you finally read something that says, hey, Lewis and Clark went down the river. Yeah, I know what that was all about. Tried it myself. And it gives you a whole lot more appreciation. That's pretty nice. You couldn't know what it feels like unless you did it. What an amazing adventure. What an amazing thing to do. To, to be in the core of discovery. I mean, God, what a place. This, this place is just so beautiful. And uh, you know that they had to be adventuresome people to want to do it in the first place. But I feel badly for the folks who didn't get a chance to, to dig on a dugout and, and do that. Because what I found was that it was having that experience and thinking, God, you know, I built these paddles. What if one breaks? I mean, I screwed up somewhere. This is important business, and you look and think they had to have some of those same thoughts. You know, they had to be thinking, this piece of equipment that I built is, has to carry us so far, and if it doesn't, we're really up a creek without a paddle. Get me wet, yabba dabba dee! When that white water's coming up, you know, you start thinking about the cargo that they had to carry, the, if they made a mistake at all, it was it was not a fun thing. It was their life was involved with everything that they had lost. You know, every item they had was an extremely precious item. On the river, you learn that the river, the current's going to take you where it's going to take you, and you can affect it a little bit, but you're you're not going to go back upstream. And they did that. I don't know how. I don't know how they did that, but. I'll tell you, on a river like this, uh, my insight is that with a bunch of guys, you learn to think like a coyote, and that is adapt to the situation. And if you didn't adapt, you were going to spend a lot of time swimming. <laughs> I wonder what it was like for them back then when they had a, 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 a uh, dugout full of supplies. You know, we recovered all ours. We had jet boats to get ours, you know. And I thought, you know, this would be one heck of a ride. It would be one, one heck of a ride. And if you can even imagine it, that first core of discovery floated from the clear water to the snake, from the snake to the Columbia, and then all the way to the Pacific Ocean in those precarious canoes. Do you think any modern achievement compares to what they achieved? I think there are a lot of parallels with the moon uh, story. Uh, the landing on the moon, but in many ways, Lewis and Clark is head and shoulders 
bigger than that, much more important than that. Why? Well, I think that they showed us what our future would be in a way that no other exp exploration ever has. There are lots of analogies. You know, Thomas Jefferson uh, and Monticello are mission control. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is the first uh, United States exploration into unknown spaces. There's a sense of bragging rights and the pride of being the first. They were setting off into a place that no white people had ever been before, ever. So every day, and this is part of the excitement of it, every day it's a new adventure. And the utterly American thrill, the achingly American thrill of what's around the next bend, mm -hmm. what's over that next rise, mm -hmm. I need to know. That's at the heart of Lewis and Clark, and that's why they're coming back, because today we're so starved for some national self definition, something that's going to connect me, who lives in New Hampshire, with you, who lives out in the West. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do we share in common? Well, what we share in common is this magnificent country and, and at least these common stories that we tell each other to remind us what we think is important. And we both agree that Lewis and Clark are important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that makes yeah. all the difference. If you'd like more information on Lewis and Clark and the expedition in Idaho, call for a copy of the Exploring Idaho Field Notes. That number is 1-800-443-2461. Be sure to ask for show number 149. The Lewis and Clark expedition is one of the most dramatic episodes in the history of the United States. And here in Idaho, the passage of Lewis and Clark has left a lasting impression. In the namesake towns of Lewiston and Clarkston, in the titles of local businesses, and on the highways and byways of Idaho, Lewis and Clark live on. But it is sad to note that in many ways, we in Idaho have become so accustomed to these modern markers, we sometimes fail to remember their historical significance. We hope this program will encourage you and your family to dig into that history, read the Lewis and Clark journals, and visit the sites where they traveled nearly 200 years ago because that sense of history only serves to enrich our understanding of the present and this incredible state in which we live. Thanks so much for joining us for this edition of Exploring Idaho. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>